Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this month's Safety Culture World Webinar on Strategies for Reducing Risk Acceptance. I'm Abby Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services, and I will be facilitating today's event. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a couple of announcements for our participants. The phone lines are muted, uh, but we do encourage you to submit questions and comments for our presenters. You can do so by communicating with me through WebEx uh, using the chat or the Q&A sections. We will use the final 10 to 15 minutes today for your questions and comments. Also, this event is being recorded. The recording and a PDF version of the slide deck will be posted to safety.cat.com later today. You will receive an email notification once those materials have been uploaded. Now I am pleased to introduce today's presenters. Dr. Mike Williamson is a certified safety professional and senior safety consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. Mike has more than 25 years of experience in the safety profession and works with organizations in a variety of industries to build employee-driven safety culture excellence. And Dave Fennell is the Senior Safety Advisor for Imperial Oil and a Senior Technical Professional for Safety for ExxonMobil. His safety management strategies and results have been featured in videos used by companies around the world. Last year, Dave was named the Canadian Safety Professional of the Year by the Canadian Society of Safety Engineering. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters, Mike and Dave. Thank you very much, Abby. This is Mike. Uh, you'll get a chance to recognize our voices as we go on. Uh, and I'd especially like to thank Dave Fennell. Uh, we've worked together for a number of years, and this topic, reducing risk tolerance, uh, is really a signature issue of Dave Fennell. And it's just a pleasure to work with Dave on what I think to be a pillar of safety as we move forward in our relentless pursuit of no injuries and eliminating incidents that could lead to injuries. Dave, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Thanks very much, Mike. Abby, am I uh, uh, live on here now? My phone had dropped. You are. I noticed that you dropped, and I brought you back in. Thanks for checking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, having been working in safety for many years, we've worked on a lot of exciting topics. This one on how to make our work site safer by reducing risk tolerance has been one of the most exciting projects that I have worked on uh, in my career as a safety uh, advisor. This is something that we all need in all of our businesses and what we hope to do today is share with you um, the results of the research we've done and give you some takeaway tools that you can use in your workplaces to reduce the acceptance of risk. We thought we'd start with just um, a bit of an introduction on what is risk tolerance. So we'll give you some insights into this concept of risk tolerance or risk acceptance. Um, and we'll talk about the 10 influencing factors that we've discovered through the, uh, uh, the research that we've done, talk about how we can apply this in the, in the workplace, and some supporting tools and strategies that, uh, that all of you can use. So as a bit of an introduction, I thought we'd just throw up three photos here that explain the concepts of risk tolerance. And what risk tolerance is, is the decisions we make based on our background, our history, our past knowledge, past experiences, and we make a determination of how much risk is acceptable. So the center photo you see is a recreational activity. Somebody on a bicycle high above, uh, on, on a cliff. And we need to ask the question, what is it about this person's background that they made the decision that they believe this was a, an activity that was safe, safe to do? Or the worker on the right has placed himself between two pieces of mobile equipment. And we need to ask the question, does he understand the position he's put himself in? Has he done this before and, and not been injured? And what is it about all those factors where he's made the determination that it's acceptable to engage in this activity? So sometimes when we're dealing with risk tolerance, we're dealing with individual thought processes. Other times we're dealing with the group thought processes very similar to the picture you see on the, on the left. Here we have 11 workers duplicating that photo from the 1920s high above the streets on, on a beam. And we need to ask the question, what kind of discussions went on? Who was the ringleader? Who were, who were the role models? Did anybody challenge the, uh, the safety of this activity? And 
ultimately they made the decision to uh, to continue with this. So that's the essence of what we're going to be exploring here today. Uh, Dave, uh, you, I know you've done quite a bit of research to come up with these 10 influencing factors. Uh, could you give us just a little insight as to how you got to this? Sure. If you go to the next slide, Abby, I think we've got a little bit uh, of the background on here. So within ExxonMobil and Imperial Oil, we began research on this. We identified a lot of incidents where the cause was hazard recognition and risk tolerance. So we decided to explore this. We gathered seven experts from around the world, behavioral experts and researchers on this concept of risk acceptance. So the Human Factor Center of, Ex of Excellence in ExxonMobil sponsored this. Um, on this group, there were uh, behavioral scientists, uh, safety practitioners, um, adult uh, educators, and what the research identified, what there, it usually comes down to 10 influencing factors. And what we have here today, Mike, is the summary, as you're aware, of what those 10 factors are, and we're prepared to, uh, to share them. And we've got some pictures here that you'll see show up again elsewhere in the presentation. The worker on the left, putting his hand on a cable that could go tight. We're saying, yes, definitely an at-risk situation, so why would the worker make that decision? Or the center photo, the worker's removing a fitting off a truck that's got water that's at 96 degrees Celsius, just below the boiling point, and he's got himself exposed to it. Or the picture on the right, two workers, one swinging a hammer and one holding the wrench. And we need to ask the question, who do we think is the senior worker here? Who made the decision that it was acceptable to uh, proceed with this? And it was those type of questions that we explored in the research, digging into all these, these types of cases and determining what is it that's going on in our brain when we make those decisions. So along with that, Dave, about how much time uh, did this group uh, work on coming up with this? Was this a, a week, a month, a year? Or how, much, how much research time did you have? This is about an 18-month uh, project, uh, individual research by uh, several of the team members leading up to it, and, and then um, about six months of intensive group research. And then once the research was complete, then putting several months into how do we communicate this so frontline supervisors, frontline safety people, and frontline workers understand it. So a very complex uh, process that we're going to try and summarize here in about 50 minutes. And, you know, from that standpoint, uh, Dave and I, uh, Dave, obviously the lead on this, but uh, we at Caterpillar have worked with Dave and with Exxon and are using these concepts in our workplace and we find them to be not only exciting but extremely valuable in the reduction of injuries. And those of you in the listening audience, I believe, are going to benefit from the rest of this presentation. So that said... Uh, with all the research and the work behind it, Dave, you're back on. So all those 18 months of research that we talked about, this is what it comes down to, is this model. So when we're talking risk tolerance, what we discovered, there are three independent processes that happen in our brains. So when there is an exposure in the workplace, some kind of risk in the workplace, the first part of our cognitive system that kicks in is the basic, do I see it? Do I see the hazard in the workplace? Some hazards are easy to see. The tripping hazard, the object that may fall from, from heights. If I don't see the hazard and I don't recognize the hazard, then I go right down to that red circle, the at-risk behavior. I didn't see the tripping hazard, so if you watch me in the workplace, you're saying, okay, this worker is not paying attention, and that's an at-risk be behavior because I didn't actually physically see the hazard. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that our workers understand or see the hazards in the workplace. Some hazards, like the housekeeping ones, are easy to see. Some hazards, like live electricity, we're going to need to give the worker a virtual way of seeing it with an indicator light or pressure in a, in a pipe system. We're going to have to give the worker a pressure gauge so they can see the hazard that they could be exposed to. So the first step that our brain needs to go through is, do we see the hazard? Once we see it, now 
our perception of risk kicks in. And this is answering the question, do I understand it? Do I understand how this hazard could impact me? So if we follow through with the, the housekeeping and the tripping standard, you know, I see it, and I can probably very easily determine how it will impact me. I could snag a foot on the cable, go down, break a wrist, hit my head, and we see how the hazard could uh, impact us. Or, so we need to understand what we're, we're seeing. If I don't understand it, then I'm going to engage in the uh, at-risk behavior. As an example, I see a wire, a bare wire, and I perceive the hazard to be that it could poke through my glove and cut my hand. So my perception is that this is a bare wire and it could cut me. What if that wire contained live electricity? You watch me do that, does that look like an at-risk behavior? Absolutely. Not because I didn't see it, but because I didn't understand it. So we need to see the hazard and then understand the risk that it uh, presents me with. Once I've got that down, now the part of the brain that kicks in is I see it, I understand it, and now I'm going to make a decision on whether that risk is acceptable or not. If I accept the risk, I engage in an at-risk behavior and put myself at, uh, in harm's way. If I decide to re reject the risk or control the risk, then I'm not accepting it and I engage in a safe behavior. So it's very important that we understand the three parts. Do I see it? Do I understand it? And what decision do I make with that? Now, if we go to the next slide, what we found through our uh, research, and this was within ExxonMobil and Imperial and looking at companies beyond, saying when it comes to hazard identification, most companies, most organizations have safety systems in place for the hazard identification. We teach people what the hazards are. We teach them how to recognize those hazards. So we give it a check mark for most organizations on that one. As we get down to the risk perception, we try to do a good job on this, but we constantly need to keep the cycle up of educating new workers who come into our workplace. So they see the hazard, and then we explain to them how that hazard could impact them. You know, is, is it a toxic gas? Is it a sharp object? And they understand, need to understand how it. So we're okay on that, but we have to really work hard at keeping that up. And the area where most organizations struggle is with the decision. We don't have systems in place, we don't have training in place that teaches the workers how to make risk-based de decisions and how to determine when a risk is, is too high, how to determine when it's acceptable. So this is where we need to put our attention is on the risk tolerance, the decision-making process about how much is acceptable. The next slide, I've got a couple of examples here. Personal example, on my personal epiphany, where I discovered this difference between hazard recognition and risk tolerance. And for years, we've been trying to address this issue of people accepting risk by providing more hazard recognition training, but it's a distinct process. So my personal epiphany on this, when I'm not the senior safety advisor at Imperial, I love being in the back country. I love going snowshoeing. I like going above the tree line and I, I just, that's what I do. Now, some of my colleagues and family members said, you seem to take a lot of risk for a safety guy. And that, that bothered me because this was happening right as we're doing this research on risk tolerance. So what I did is got myself some really good hazard recognition training, how to recognize the hazards of snow conditions and avalanche conditions and safety conditions in the back country in, in the mountains. So I went to the University of Calgary and they offer a two-day avalanche awareness uh, course. And the first day we spent in the classroom learning all about how to identify the hazards based on the slope and the weather conditions, um, time of day, how to identify hazards of, of the snow. On the second day of the program, what they did is took us out to, and I'm going to refer to it as the workplace, but they took us out to Bow Summit in the Canadian Rockies to see if the hazard recognition we learned in the classroom, if we could apply it in the field. So we hiked up to uh, Bow Summit, and the bottom right picture, what we're doing is we're taking measurements, um, 
cutting through the snow, looking for the coefficients of, of uh, friction on the snow, looking where the layers were, the angle of the slope, uh, the attitude of the slope. And very quickly, we started determining that snow conditions that weekend in the Canadian Rockies were ripe for an avalanche. And the instructor asked us, he said, how many of you people believe the slope is ready to avalanche? And 14 people in the group, 14 people put their hands up and said the slope is ready to, to avalanche. 100% perfect hazard recognition. We took a safe route up and we hiked up to the top of one of those slopes you see in the picture. And we took more measurements at the top and looked at the angle of the slope and down, down the hill. And the instructor again asked the question, how many people believe that slope is ready to avalanche? And 14 people, 100% of the people put their hand up. And then he asked another question, how many of you are prepared to go down that slope anyway? And 12 people put their hand up. 12 out of 14 people who passed 100% on the competency test of recognizing the hazard, 12 out of 14 said they would be prepared to accept the risk anyway. And that is what's happening in our workplaces as well. We're providing our workers with the hazard recognition training and the safety training. They go out to the workplace and then we don't understand why they accepted the risk. And the reason is hazard recognition and risk tolerance are two independent topics and we need to get better at teaching people how to make those risk-based decisions. And I would suggest that most of you in your workplaces do have the hazard recognition part down. If you go to the next slide, Abby, I've got a couple of examples from the workplace. The picture in the top left, what the job safety analysis, the pre-job planning, the JSA for this job said, the hazard of the job is when I swing the hammer, it could bounce off the metal and hit my buddy's hand who's holding the wrench. And do you know what the incident investigation said? As I swung the hammer, it bounced off the metal and hit my buddy's hand who was holding the hammer. Absolute perfect. They identified the hazard, but went ahead with the job anyway. The middle picture, what the JSA said for the job, the hazard is the extension on the wrench could slip off the end of the wrench and hit somebody in the teeth. And do you know what the investigation said? As I pulled on the wrench, extension, it slipped off the end of the wrench and hit me in the teeth and the worker lost a couple of teeth. Perfect hazard recognition. And the one on the far right, a post pounder. And the hazard they identified, the workers themselves identified on the JSA was, the hazard is as I lift this up, it could come off the top of the pole and crush my hand on top of the, uh, the rod. And that's exactly what happened. So the workers are good at hazard recognition, but they're not sure what to do about it. And what do you think Every one of those JSAs said as the mitigating action. And if you click the button, Abby, be careful. Whenever you see the words be careful on your JSA, on your hazard identification uh, process, that's like those 12 people on the hill who said, I recognize the hazard, but I'm going to go ahead with the job anyway and be careful. So when you see that, that's an indication that we've got high risk tolerance in the uh, in the workplace. So if you click once more, Abby, there's a message there. We don't want to see that. That's your indication that you have risk tolerance in the, uh, in the workplace. So if we go to the next slide, what Mike and I are going to do now is we're going to talk about these 10 factors. Uh, we're going to show you how to identify it in your workplace and then give you some tips, some immediate tips on what you can do about it to help your workers make these risk-based uh, decisions. So I'll lead off with factor number one, overestimating capability and, uh, and experience. The next slide, Ab. So when we overestimate our physical ability in our experience, we take more risks. And we see it sometimes a worker overestimating their strength with quotes like you see at the top. I can lift 75 kilograms in the gym. Why won't you let me lift this object in the, in the workplace? I'm strong enough. I'm fit enough. I can, I can do this. Here's a, a workplace example that happened a few years ago on our site uh, here at Imperial. A worker, his name was Chris. Chris picked up a, a pipe and was carrying it. And as he was walking with this pipe, he slipped and fell. And the pipe came down and fractured the base of his skull. He was off work for four months. And I didn't get to meet Chris, but they told me about Chris. They said, we don't understand how it could happen to him. 
He was young. He's 23 years old. He's powerful. He exercises in the gym at the camp every night. We don't understand how somebody that strong could have something like this happen. And they asked Chris, they said, how heavy do you think the pipe was? He said it was pretty heavy. He said it was about 50 pounds. When they actually measured the weight of the pipe, it was 196 pounds. So was Chris overestimating his physical capability? Yes. And did he take more risk because of it? Yes. And did it result in an incident? Unfortunately, yes. Now, sometimes a worker may not be overestimating their um, strength. They may be overestimating their agility, that I can move pretty quick. I'll get my hand out of the line of fire before it gets crushed. I'll be, I'll be able to keep my balance in that, in that situation. And they overestimate their physical, their agility. As an example, once again, as we were doing the research, this near miss came in from one of our organizations. And I'm going to quote you the exact words from the near miss report. As I stepped outside the office trailer, I stepped onto a patch of ice. My superior agility and cat-like reflexes kicked in, preventing certain death. A lesser man would have been killed. Now, that near miss may have been in jest, but the work's saying, don't worry about the slipping hazard. Don't worry about the tripping hazard. I've got cat-like reflexes, and I'll be able to manage that with my, my agility. So we take more risks when we overestimate our physical capability. Now, that usually applies to younger workers. As we get older, to the age of people like um, Dr. Mike Williamson and uh, Dave Fennell, we're not as strong or as fast as we used to be. So what do we count on? We count on our experience, our smarts to keep us out of trouble, our years of, of driving experience or our years of the workplace experience. And that's what we use to keep ourselves out of, out of trouble. Now, how do we address these? Some basic tips here. When we're overestimating our experience, we need to ask the question, is this the way I would teach a new worker to do this job? If this new worker was my son or daughter or somebody I loved, is this the way I would teach them to do that job? And that reigns us in and says, maybe we are overestimating our experience. So when we reflect on our role as a mentor, we teach other people how to do it the correct way and we reduce our own risk acceptance. For the young workers who, uh, who may think they're stronger and more agile than they actually are, we just need a simple safety conversation. Taking a stop and think moment with them, acknowledging their strength and agility, but then stating the standards for your workplace. On this workplace, we don't lift more than 50 kilograms. And yes, I know you could, but on this workplace, we don't do that. And on this workplace, we clean up the slipping hazards because maybe not everybody around here is as agile as you and be able to keep their balance so we clean up the, uh, the slipping hazards. So that's factor number one, how to recognize it and some tips on what you can do about it. Factor thank number you, two. Dave. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, this one deals with familiarity with the task, which then leads to complacency. I've done it so many times that I'll always do it carefully and correctly. Uh, the picture on the left, uh, again, a man with a wrench. And what's happening? He's in the line of fire, probably the first 10 times, 50 times, out of the way. And then after the 500th time, I've done this so many times, stands in the way, the wrench slips, and another set of teeth. Uh, the center area, stacking boards, done this all day, uh, get sloppy and put a hand in the wrong spot, and there goes another crushed hand. Uh, the, the picture on the right, the three-point of contacts and doing it day in and day out, hour after hour, get sloppy, slip, and the person gets injured. Probably my favorite example here is a personal one. Uh, recently, my wife went in for what I would consider some pretty technical back surgery for a fractured vertebrae in her back. And I guarantee you, I made a point of interviewing the doctor that was going to do that. And one of the questions was, how many times have you done this? And I got an answer that looks right like these pictures here, and though I've done this hundreds of times, I really know what I'm doing. And I asked him, have you had any failures? And he said, well, a few, but not many. And then we went into what's he going to do and how's he going to do it, and I used the concept right here. 
on stop and think, and that is I want you to treat this coming surgery as if it's the first time you've ever done it and there is no complacency, and talk yourself through it. Because as you work on the job and you talk yourself through the job, the audio piece and the visual piece and the understanding piece come together, and we don't become complacent. And indeed, he wasn't. Uh, The surgery turned out well. But this familiarity with the task is a real issue in our workplaces every day. Your turn, Dave. Next slide. That's great, Mike. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we can teach our frontline workers how to do what that that surgeon did and be able to focus on the job like it's the uh, uh, the first time? That'd be a great thing to have in the workplace. And I think some of our simple tools, like a simple stop and think process, can help us with that. Factor number three: when we believe the outcome of our actions will be very serious, we take less risk. So this is a good one. If our workers actually understand the seriousness of the outcome, they will have less acceptance for the risk. But we have a problem here. Some of the language we use discounts how serious the risk could be. And if you look at this picture, a person's got their hand on a cable, what do we traditionally call that type of hazard? A pinch point. Does the word pinch really sound that serious? I'm sure we've all been pinched at one time or the other, and it doesn't sound that serious. When we refer to this as a pinch point, a new worker may say, oh, I could get my hand pinched. Wouldn't it be more effective, and wouldn't it be more in line with the outcome if we called this a crush point, an amputation point? If that cable goes tight, your hand will be amputated. Is a worker going to pay more attention to that than a pinch point? So we can get this message across simply by changing the the language. In the business I work in, we deal with gas, natural gas. And sometimes it has toxics in it, sour gas we call it. And people pay attention to that. They know the hazard is serious. But when it doesn't have the, the hydrogen sulfide, the toxic element in it, we refer to it as sweet gas. Sweet gas. Doesn't that sound nice? It's not sweet gas. It's explosive. It's flammable. Many, many people have died when they've been caught in clouds of sweet gas that have ignited. So we've got to make sure that we don't allow works to believe, oh, this is safe, because we call it sweet gas. And I think everybody who's on on the phone here, we, we need to think about what language do we use to describe hazards? Another hazard in our business that's very prevalent right now is hot water. We use a lot of hot water to to process our products. And most people, when they think of hot water, think of a shower, a jacuzzi, uh, maybe maybe a beach. The hot water that we're referring to here is condensed steam, water at 99 degrees Celsius, water that when it touches your skin for more than three seconds, you will have second and third degree burns. This is industrial hot water, scalding hot water, and we have to make sure we don't discount the, um, you know, how serious it can be. And the same thing happens when we're directing mobile equipment, the big equipment around our our work sites, and we make sure that we use spotters and signalers so we take care of that. And a worker commented uh, to me um, on that. He said, "You guys are so fussed about the paint scratches and the dents on the equipment. Is that how serious it can be?" No, every year, dozens of workers are killed where they're run over by mobile equipment. That's why we need this, the signalers and the spotters and this integrity with equipment movement, because people have died being run over by mobile equipment. This is more than dents and scratches. So how do we get our workers to really pay attention to it? First thing is, check the language that we're using to describe it. And the second, I'm going to refer back to, again, a simple stop and think process. And every stop and think process should have a couple of questions on it. What could go wrong and how bad could it be? And have discussions with our workers so they really do understand how serious the outcome could be and that they don't gloss over it because of the the language in the workplace. Mike, factor number four. I I see this as well, Dave, all the time uh, globally that uh, the signs are benign and the dangers are 
potential fatalities. Uh, this is a very common issue in the workplace. Abby, let's take a look at the next one. Uh, that deals with kind of voluntary actions, things that we can be in control of, but maybe aren't. Uh, a lot of this deals with off-the-job type of activities. Uh, the upper right-hand picture, uh, a life vest for a person who does kayaking. That would be Dave. And uh, how does he go there to in this voluntary activity and be safe? Uh, the picture on the left, um, how many of us would trade in our pickup truck uh, at work and use this vehicle, a, a motorcycle, to get our job done? We would never even consider this. Uh, and once upon a time, uh, many years ago, I was riding a motorcycle as a young person, uh, pretty confident of my ability. Yes, I had the helmet on and everything, and as I was going through the city, a man took a left-hand turn right in front of me, and I went through the windshield. And I thought, you know, m riding a motorcycle is fun, but it's not that much fun. And I decided that my risk tolerance needed to change significantly, and, and it has. And so and I live on a farm, and uh, this next week I'm going to be taking down a number of trees that have died over the last year, large trees. And my neighbor, who needs the firewood, uh, is going to come and help me. And yesterday we went through the woods and looked at every one of the trees and decided how we would take them down and what time. Uh, we do them in the morning when we're fresher. Uh, they've talked about being older. And I uh, went through a pre-job risk assessment where it was going to fall and the like to make sure that when we're in there in the job, we paid attention to it. And these voluntary actions off the job, uh, the comment there, 28 more times likely to be hurt off the job. Uh, here at Caterpillar, uh, we worked a little bit with the National Safety Council, and the data they came back with was that industrial employees were 90 nine zero times more likely to be killed off the job than on the job. And that 70% of the medical cases for industrial employees occurred off the job. And so these voluntary activities really require us to stop and think and put those barriers to injuries in front of us off the job. And obviously on the job as well. Are we doing this job safely? Next, Dave. That's really powerful. I want to reinforce the the off the job and the voluntary activities. Um, many people, I'm sure, are bringing you know young workers in into the workplace, so we, we need them thinking about risk acceptance off the job as, as well, and taking a simple process like a stop and think process. I, my belief is that everybody who's a Boy Scout leader, a Girl Guide leader, who leads some kind of community activities in teaching children should have a stop and think card in their pocket to help the next generation coming into our workplaces learn how to do risk assessments, mental risk assessments for any activity, whether it's workplace or uh, off the job. Next slide, Abby. Tied in with factor number three um, is a personal experience with an outcome. So if we know the outcome could be serious of our actions, and if we've had a personal experience with an outcome like that, we have very, very low acceptance for the risk. Now, that's a good thing. But unfortunately, as our workplaces improve and the safety gets better, we're going to have more and more workers in our workplace who have never seen a serious incident. And they may become skeptical and wonder, could that really happen? I've heard these stories about it happen, but could it really happen? and we're going to get complacency setting in and the skepticism. So we need to make sure that our new workers understand how serious the outcomes could be. And where they're going to get that information is from their mentors and from their supervisors and from the people that we refer to as the keepers of the corporate memory, the person who can refer back and talk about that serious incident that happened 10 years ago and what we learned from it. And that's why we have this particular standard in place uh, today. I put the picture on the uh, on the right there. This is a piece of rotating equipment, a winch. I've investigated two fatalities in my career where workers have got caught in rotating equipment. Um, 
this was a reenactment of one of them where a worker's fall arrest harness got caught in a in a winch. Now that was a long time ago. But workers today, when I see them getting sloppy around the guarding on rotating equipment, they need to be reminded of those is that Phil and Raymond were two workers who lost their lives on a setup just like you have here. That's why the guarding is important. So anytime we can connect personally with the newer workers, we're going to reduce their acceptance of risk in the workplace. Dave, uh, you know, another poignant piece, if you'll back up one, Abby. Uh, and uh, a, a few years back, I was director of operations for an explosives uh, manufacturing facility. And one of the things that really impressed me, within the first week, and one of the employees came up to me and said, I'd like to show you something. And we went out to a remote job site, and he showed me the site where his best friend had been killed. And that this is a very serious and very dangerous type of industry. And as director of operations, I need you to make sure that people understand the dangers of what we work and reinforce the importance of safety. And that has stuck with me. And Dave's concept here of personal experience, uh, even anniversaries of tragedies that have occurred, uh, we have those. And we need to explain to people how serious it can be and how they must take their personal experiences and personal risk assessment and do something correct about it. Uh, good example, Dave. Thank you. Let's move on to number six, and that's the cost of noncompliance. Uh, here, what could go wrong and how serious could it be? Uh, it certainly... Uh, we have all seen that 1920s photo of the erection of the Empire State Building in New York with the people standing and sitting on the girder, and I wouldn't do that. But how serious could it be, the cost of noncompliance? And the answer is a fatality. Uh, the picture on the right dealing with lockout tagout. Uh, what cost is the noncompliance to energy uh, elimination? And the answer is, a potential fatality. Uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, the picture on the left deals with traffic. And um, I don't know of anybody that is 100% uh, exact on speed limits, but I recently had an example of that for myself in that I was coming back from an airport trip on a weekend and I was going through a construction zone and there were no construction workers. In fact, there wasn't even any traffic. And so I bumped my speed up to what would be normal for a road that was wide open that did not have a lot of hazards on it, uh, and it was manageable. And there was a sign there that said camera control, and sure enough, three weeks later, I got a picture of my car and what I considered to be a very healthy fine. And the next time I rode through that construction area, I guarantee you I was at the speed limit uh, and not taking the shortcuts that I was confident I could take. And so that cost of noncompliance needs to be told about in the workplace and reinforced that this is necessary on the job and off the job and those barriers uh, that allow us to mentally uh, take more risks we can't remove those. We must pay attention to the cost of noncompliance. That's good, Mike, because what that does as well, it tells us in the workplace that we need up front to decide on what are those things that are so important to us that we're going to allow no variance at all. Working at heights, lockout, energy isolation, what are those things? And then let the workers know because the physical consequences are so high, if you're not complying with those standards, there is, is going to be other costs of noncompliance in, in, this, in this workplace before they become incidents. It can be a very powerful tool. Factor number seven. Sometimes we get overconfident in the equipment we're using, and we believe the equipment will protect us, and therefore we take more risks. This is the work of uh, Dr. Um, oh, sorry, I can't remember his name, Gerald Wilder, and he talks about a concept called risk homeostasis, that as humans, we're prepared to accept a certain amount of risk. So if I give you a safer product, 
you feel you can take more chances. If I give you a ladder that's twice as stable as any other ladder ever built, what goes on in our brain says, oh, now we can climb twice as high. And the studies that were done in the U.S., when anti-lock brakes and airbags were first introduced to, to vehicles, they observed that drivers with anti-lock brakes drove significantly more aggressive than those without. I have anti-lock brakes. I can stop twice as fast. Therefore, I can drive twice as fast. So because we become overconfident in the equipment, we increase our risk. And very, one that um, really drives this home was the British study on parachuting fatalities. 45 years ago, they did a study. People die parachuting. Number one cause was an equipment failure. The chute failed to deploy. Today, in 2014, that equipment is safer than it's ever been. It will deploy when you pull the ripcord. It will deploy at a, a altitude um, automatically. So the equipment will deploy. The number of fatalities in that sport has not dropped. But the cause of death now has. Now it's no longer an equipment failure. Now it's late deployment. The people engaged in that have become so confident in the equipment, they can take more risks, a few hundred more meters of free fall, and then splat into the ground with a partially deployed chute. And the same thing happens with some of the tools we use in the workplace. The picture on the left is an open hook, unrated bungee cord. And the worker is so confident that these things never fail, he's pulling it like a reverse slingshot toward his teeth. And they do, they do fail. Why are we so confident in that piece of equipment? The middle one was an example from our worksite where they had brand new slings to do a lift. And they were confident that the slings wouldn't fail because they were brand new. But one of the workers insisted that they ask the question, what will happen if it does fail? So they made sure they had the tag lines on and nobody was near the load. And the, the sling actually got cut on the way up. It snagged on something and got cut and the load dropped. But because they had anticipated this brand new piece of equipment could fail, no one was injured. The next one, Mike, is a similar one that talks about protective equipment. You know, uh, that overconfidence in the PPE, the personal protective equipment we have, uh, is very common in the workplace. The picture on the left, uh, flame resistant, no max clothing. Uh, people are confident that they won't be burned, and yet the clothing doesn't burn. But what about what's behind the clothing when it's exposed to high temperatures? Uh, the impact resistant gloves, uh, they're impact resistant. They're not impact-proof. And once again, employees' overconfidence in the equipment, the impact-resistant, crush-proof gloves are not crush-proof. And if we put our hands in the wrong place and the wrong thing happens, then these impact-resistant gloves really become baggies for our severed members because we had overconfidence in them. Uh, the picture on the right deals with a gas detector, in this case H2S, uh, but what other type of gases are there around in the workplace? Uh, my first job uh, out of college was a refinery engineer, and uh, they weren't near as careful as they needed to be. And sure, we had H2S monitors, but what about propane on the ground? And that was an area that had led to a number of injuries. Uh, underground mining, we have methane sensors, but there's other things there as well. And so even though we have protective equipment, uh, we need to go beyond just thinking that it's going to save us because it's there as a barrier, but not the only barrier. It's the last line of defense that must be paid attention to, but we must also go beyond counting on the last line of defense. And Howie Dingle is kind of an interesting story. Fill us in on this one, Dave. Howie was one of our previous vice presidents, and he was trying to get the message to the workers that um, they're being overconfident in their protective equipment. And he made this statement that every job should be able to be done safely by a 65-year-old with a bad back. What are you saying there? Some jobs are just, we should be using machines instead of people. But he continued on the sentence, every job should be able to be done safely by a 65-year-old with a bad back and butt naked. Now, what Howie was trying to do is communicate to the workers is that would you do that job the same way if you were standing there with no protective equipment on? Would you put your bare hand on that cable that you saw a couple of slides back? And most workers say, no, 
So I said, well, don't do it with your glove on. Would you stand there and bypass the flame arrestor on a burner with a burning rag on the end of the stick standing there, butt naked, no fire retardant clothing on? Would you do that? And most people say, no, I don't feel protected. So don't do it with your protective equipment on either. That's your last line of defense. So picture yourself stark naked in the, in the workplace. Would you do the job the same, same way? It's kind of a dramatic way of getting the, the message across to, uh, to workers. Factor number nine. When we feel we either have personal or corporate gain from our actions, we take more risks. And we see it happen every time the economy booms. There's more fatalities. There's more incidents on the highway because we're going to get one more load through. And no, the truck hadn't been inspected. And no, the driver wasn't fully trained, but we can get one more load through. Or I'm going to work 18 hours straight through because I'm going to get overtime. And there's personal gain uh, from it. So we have to be careful that we don't set systems up where workers will take risks and increase their acceptance of risk because there's uh, profit to be gained. We see that depending on how we pay gravel haulers, truckers. When we pay them by the load, they drive more aggressively. They overload their trucks. They just coast through the, the stop signs. When we pay them by the hour, they actually turn out to be more productive and there's no incentive to not follow the, the safety standards. Personal story here that really gets this across. The picture on the right is a perforating gun. In the oil and gas industry, when we drill a well, we put a steel casing down the hole, cement it into place. The purpose of a perforating gun is it's got explosive charges in it that radiate out. We send it down the hole. It blows holes in the steel casing, the cement, and into the rock formation so we can get the oil out of the, the formation. I investigated an incident on September 9th, 1999. And what we learned through the investigation is that the blasters in the industry were getting paid by the shot, not by the hour. So when they got paid by the shot, they took just a few more risks. They learned how to take shortcuts. And what you're supposed to do, if you pulled a, a misfired gun out of the hole, you're supposed to disarm electrically, take the wires off, and disarm ballistically, pull the blasting cap out. What this means is you probably won't get another shot in that day and you won't get paid. The blasters who are getting paid by the shot, what they learned is if you took a, an unfired gun out of the hole, you could disconnect electrically, leave the blasting cap in, fix whatever the problem is, do a circuit test, and you could rerun the gun and get paid for your, your shot. But on September 9th, 1999, when the, the blaster connected the wrong wires to do his circuit test and he left the cap in the gun, he discharged the gun on the surface, and he blew a hole right through my buddy Don's chest. And we, the organizations who had been paying, paying blasters by the shot, we created an incentive that ended up in the fatality of my, my buddy. We cannot create incentives that encourage risk-taking. Factor number 10, Mike. Hey, thank you, Dave. Uh, you can see from the time frame that uh, we're getting a little bit short at the end, but a lot of material to cover here. And we didn't want to go to half of these because these are extremely important in the workplace. Uh, the last one, role models that accept risk, uh, is kind of an everyday occurrence uh, with senior employees. In the electrical utility field, I can't tell you how many times I've seen employees that have been there for years, decades, that have learned to be able to take these shortcuts and where upper management appreciates them because they get the job done, they get it done quickly and uh, that leads to more productivity and more uptime uh, with the utilities which is something that they are rated on by regulatory agencies. And what they're doing, however, is they're setting an example for the new employees that say it's okay to take this risk. And the new employees honestly do not understand uh, the risks, the seriousness of it, or what should be done. Uh, they follow the role models example, and that leads them down a path that can lead to serious injuries and fatalities. And I've talked to a number of upper managers that say, you need to have a, a frontline discussion with these people and tell them that in our workplace, we just don't take these risks. I don't care how productive it is. 
your body and your crews are more important than the little bit of time you'll save. And Dave's going to talk to you a little bit about this interesting snowshoe adventure uh, and that same role model issue. Dave? Yeah, I think it's important. I'm going to give you a tangible example that shows the importance of role models when it comes to risk. And I'm going to bring you back out to Bow Summit in the snowshoeing story. Remember we said 12 or 14 people put their hand up and said they'd go down the hill. But it was very interesting how it unfolded. Within the first day of the course, there was two people in the group who established themselves as the go-to people. They were young, they were cool, they were hip, um, they seemed knowledgeable and confident. And even by the end of the first day, when people had questions, they would go to these two individuals and bypass the instructor. So when we're out on the hill and the instructor said, who's prepared to go down the slope? Instantly, these two people put their hands in the air. And I had an opportunity to talk to them, and I asked the one, I said, why, why would you do that? And what he said was, uh, he was such a good snowboarder. He'd been in situations like this before. When the avalanche happened, not if it was going to happen or not, when it happened, he was going to scoot down the slope, do a wall, you over the slip, dart in behind the cliff, and whoosh, the avalanche would go past him. Cat-like reflexes. So he's prepared to go down. He's overestimating his capability and agility. His partner, who also put his hand up, said, why would you do this? And what he said was, um, we've taken a day of avalanche safety. We've all got the beacons, the probes, and the shovels. And he said, I'm pretty sure you guys could dig me out. Which risk tolerance factor is that? Number eight, overconfidence in the rescue. So these two role models, for their own reasons, said they were prepared to take the risk. Eight other people in the group who hadn't made their minds up took a look over, saw that the role models would do it, and eight other hands went up into the air. So the role models, because of their decision, they impacted the decision of eight other people. There was two other people in the group, and I didn't get to talk to them, but I could tell they, they understood what the hazard was. They had a good perception of the risk, and the decision they wanted to make was not go down the hill. But they're under some pressure now, aren't they? And we call that peer pressure. And they looked over, and all the role models and all the cool people have put their hands up, and they're on the other side of the hill, there's Dave in his old wooden snowshoes, and that wasn't the cool thing to do. And they, they made the decision, and reluctantly, their two hands went into the air as well. So these role models who were the risk takers impacted the decisions of 12 or 10 other people and, and put them in a position where they, they may take more risks. So it's important for us in the workplace to understand, do we know who the unofficial role models are, and do we know their level of risk acceptance in the workplace? Look for those people. Next slide, Abby. So there's your 10 factors. Now, just to be educated on the 10 factors is not enough. We need to commit to action on this. And the actions that we discovered through our research, I am sure all of you have the tools in your workplace to move to action. You've got some kind of hazard identification process. You've got some kind of pre-job planning process like a JSA. And what we have to teach our workers is to ask some basic questions every time they're planning for a job. Or when a job comes off the rails and isn't going the way they planned, they ask three basic questions. What could go wrong? How bad could it be? And what do I need to do about this? And the I need to do about it can't be just the declaration that I will be careful. What specific action do I need to take to reduce the risk of this, this activity? The next slide. Next one, Abby. Thanks. The way we're going to do this is create conversations about risk tolerance in the workplace. And we're going to create those conversations when we're giving feedback after doing a behavior or a job observation. We're going to create stop and think moments where we pull a card that looks like that out of our pocket and ask the questions of our workers. What could go wrong? How bad could it be? Has anything changed? Have we ever seen something like that in the, in the past? And help our workers with those, those decisions and talk to them about the past experiences so they, they can learn, learn from it. So use the tools you've got in your immediate workplace and you can start making a, a dent on this thing we call risk tolerance. The next slide. You need a basic stop and think process and you need your workers to understand that they are risk takers. 
And going through a simple process like asking each worker to identify a risk that they knowingly take in the workplace is a great start. It opens up the conversation on it. So you can use you know, the stop and think card here, the back of it, as you see in this presentation, to prompt those discussions in, in your workplace. In the next slide, just some basic resources. Um, what we do have is all this material has been compiled by ExxonMobil and Imperial onto a, uh, a DVD, the presentations, worksheets, um, safety meeting topics on all the individual modules. And we're currently in negotiations with um, Caterpillar Safety Services where this material can be made to people beyond ExxonMobil, Imperial, and our, uh, our contractors. So I encourage you, watch for this material. And what it'll do, it'll give you everything that you need to be able to address this issue in your workplaces. And the next one, uh, Abby. And in the meantime, three basic tools for you. The listing on the right of what the 10 factors are, the 10 influencing factors for risk tolerance, incorporate that into your language, a simple stop and think process, and a pre-job planning process. This is where we're gonna create the discussions on risk tolerance. Dave, thank you very much. Uh, really excellent presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, yeah, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining, especially those who need to cut out at the top of the hour. We will continue on past the hour to take your questions and your comments. Uh, but for those of you that need to drop off, thanks for joining us today. You will receive an email follow-up with a link to the recording and a link to the PDF version of uh, Mike and Dave's slide deck. So on with the questions. Uh, I will read the questions that came through Mike and Dave, and then you can uh, choose who uh, takes them or, or share, in, share in the response. So the first was, once a worker decides to reject the hazard, he then has to deal with the results of stopping or slowing down the immediate progress of the job. Often he knows that his supervisor or the customer is not going to be happy. Actually, the worker most often weighs this fact when determining to accept or reject the risk. Have you looked into this fact and do you offer training for this? I think this is related to factor number nine, Dave. I mean, you may have some additional insights and Mike as well on this. It very much is, Abby, related to factor number nine, that the um, the profit and gain from it, you know, the, the gain may be my continued employment, getting the job done faster, being recognized by our, our client for it. Um, and that's where it becomes very difficult to just do risk tolerance as an independent uh, project. We need all our workers, all our supervisors buying into it. So the training, we need the buy-in from, from the top and things simple that it is acceptable to, to stop a job. And if everybody's speaking the, the same language where a worker says, you know, I'm, I'm stopping I'm this job because I don't think we're addressing risk tolerance factor number three. I don't think we're assessed how serious the outcome of this, this can be. And once we get the common language from the management through the supervisors, the frontline workers, um, then it becomes easy conversations to have in the workplace. And that's why at ExxonMobil and Imperial, we have shared all this information with all of our contractors so that we are speaking the, the same language when it comes to risk uh, tolerance. You know, Dave, uh, from a, the standpoint of have a safety culture that is correct, uh, this the item number nine comes up all the time, uh, certainly in Caterpillar as we uh, service equipment as we work in the field, uh, there's always a push to get the job done. And we find that our distributors and our technicians have to make a personal commitment that our culture at Caterpillar is we don't take risks. And this is expensive, it's difficult equipment, and we just don't take these risks that put us in an area where we could get injured. And we find that more and more of our customers are saying, you know what you're doing, you're sending the right example to our people that are watching you, and we value that. And it takes a while for that to occur uh, in the workplace because of the 50-plus years that we haven't paid attention to stuff like this. It's a personal commitment. Okay, and also related to factor number nine, we had someone ask if there were other non-fiscal profits or gains studied for example, doing the job right may mean uh, less personal time or less sleep uh, or other personal factors. 
Yes, yeah, so Abby, we, we did address that in our research and uh, you know, factor number nine started as looking at the monetary profit and gain and then we got into the, the intangibles from it. So more time off, being more relaxed, we're seeing as profit and um, gain on the individual uh, basis. So that does in fact uh, play a factor in it. Um, what we also found was questions came up about the adrenaline rush. Some people take risks for the adrenaline rush, and we especially see it off the job. And we've loosely connected that to number nine, too, because the personal gain there is that, that rush. That one becomes much more difficult to, uh, to control off the job. In the workplace, we can, you know, having people follow to the standards and let them know that behavior is not acceptable. That'll be a difficult one to address off the job because not sure exactly how to address it, that personal factor of the adrenaline rush. But when we equate it to number nine, if we can acknowledge it there, um, that'll give us a, uh, a step up. You know, uh, to give some feedback along the same line, uh, what Dave has done and Exxon and the organizations they've worked with is they've brought up a significant awareness on these risks that in the past wasn't there. And so, yes, the adrenaline rush, the potential for uh, more money, the potential for time off the job come into play, but in the past, we didn't recognize that. And so as you go through this type of training, uh, the resources Dave mentioned that we use are bringing these concepts up, these risks, this idea of risk tolerance, personal risk assessment that goes with that. And that awareness has our people stopping and thinking as a part of their culture, or in the past, really weren't that aware of it. And so the training that we've talked about today, very important in putting forth the concept, the understanding, the knowledge, and then the skills and the attitudes that go with it. Okay, thank you. And another participant said, Hi, Dave. We have been using your risk tolerance factors to change the discussion in our organization. I think it has been a great initiative to take and has opened some eyes to what we would tolerate. I would like to know how you have balanced the conversation so you limit the quote-unquote nanny state pushback that you get from operations since people are inherently risk-taking creatures. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to hear that people are using the, uh, the risk tolerance material and you know the benefits are huge from it. The, the downside is it raises questions like, like that. People are starting to talk about these issues in uh, in, in in the workplace. So I'm not sure exactly what the nanny complex uh, uh, is, but our research did point out strongly that as humans, we are risk takers. We are prepared to accept a certain amount of risk. And what we also discovered was risk acceptance is like any other kind of addiction. Unless you admit you have a problem, there's nothing we can do about it. So we've got to open up these discussions and like the back of that card that you saw on the uh, second last slide, ask each worker, just, just one, just identify one risk that you knowingly take and make one, one commitment to do something about that. The power of that is not that the worker identified that risk and did something about it. The power is they opened up the discussion. They admitted they were a risk taker. And if we could do it over the phone, Abby, I'd have everybody on the phone raise their right hand and say, hi, my name is Dave and I'm a risk taker. Do that in front of your work groups, and then we open up this, this discussion so we admit we're risk takers, and then we can do something about this addiction. Okay, thanks. That is, that's all the questions and comments that came in through WebEx. Um, in, unless there's anything else, Mike or Dave, you'd like to share at this point, uh, we can close it up, but I uh, just want to give you this one last opportunity. I'm uh, very happy very with much. the presentation. Thank you, Abby, for setting it up. Dave, thank you for participating and leading. And for all those on the phone, thank you for listening. This is an extremely important topic. We need more people listening about it, and I hope each of you become the advocates and the evangelists to talk about this concept in our workplace. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, presenters, and thank you, attendees. I want to call your attention, lastly, to the information on the screen now, which 
uh, we'll point you to our website, safety.cat.com slash webinars, where you can get information about our upcoming webinar events. You can see recordings of our archived webinars from uh, earlier in the year, and certainly communicate with us through safety services at cat.com or through a variety of channels through the website. So thanks again for joining us. Our next event is October 22nd. I hope you'll join us for that one as well. And in the meantime, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.